Uh, hey, my name is Steve Treichler. If I haven't had a chance to to meet you, um, I'm one of the pastors here at Hope. I'm actually the OG. I'm the original guy. I helped start the church in 1996. That same summer, we were gathering to I'm not used to having a book up here. Anyway, um, uh, gathering to get ready for the church, and so uh, happy to still be around. 27 years uh, later, with this summer, we are in a series. Uh, called Not Just Another Story. And we're basically taking time to look at um, different accounts of Jesus. Some of them are parables. Uh, today's is not so much a parable as it is kind of a, something he's trying to teach us. Uh, and so by Core's good graciousness, uh, he allowed me to preach this this week because last week I I didn't think COVID was still a thing, but uh, late last week I ended up picking that thing up. And so... Son of a gun, and I'm fine. It was nothing more than a bad cold, but, but, and I lost my taste and smell. So none of you smell bad to me today at all. Um, so, but uh, other than that, it was, it was fine. But, and I'm, I count the days, I'm fine. Today's a fine day. So uh, you're all like, hmm, maybe we can make it to another church here real quick. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, I told Cor, I said, oh man, I really shouldn't be there can I still do this because I'm ready and I'm really excited about this passage. And so I'm going to look at a passage of scripture with you this morning. It's an account of Jesus. Again, it's not so much a parable or a story per se, but it is a thing where Jesus is proclaiming an account. He's giving some, some Old Testament imagery and he's going to show us some things. And the things when, when Jesus teaches, he's, he's a master teacher. I, that was my undergraduate degree was uh, math education. And so I, I love how you see how Jesus is a master teacher. He sucks you into a story, he sucks you into things, and then he leaves you with somewhat of a twist that the point of it is you should walk away and kind of go, hmm, What's going on there? And that's what he's going to do today for sure uh, in a couple different ways. So um, this time I'm just going to walk through the passage one time because I kind of want to let the passage unfold. So if you got a Bible with you, okay, open it up to Luke 17. We'll be looking at verses 20 all the way down to 30, who? 30, 30, 30, 37. So, uh, and so, or you can just look on the screen if you want. That'd be great too. So, Here's how it starts. It says, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Okay? So, a couple things here just to notice right off. This is one of those accounts uh, that Jesus is going, that Luke is going to give us in his gospel that doesn't necessarily mean that it follows the previous one. Uh, 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 you know, what do you call it? Chronologically. So it just says once. Now it could be that it was, it was happened right then following what happens previously. If you look what happens, there was a healing of some lepers and only one of them was grateful for it. And it could be, and, and, but he's going to bring this story up. And then he's asked by the Pharisees about when the kingdom of God would come. Now, that's significant. Let me, let me quote from a, an old commentary, actually written in the 1950s. Uh, let me quote here. It says, there was no more burning question, especially to the Pharisees, than that concerning the time when the kingdom of God would be called into being by the Messiah. So the Pharisees, and what they expected was, Messiah would come, he would then call this kingdom in, and now this would be a kingdom that would be better than Israel when it was a nation. It would be the superpower. It would be a spiritual, supernatural power on the earth, and it would reign. That's what they were looking for. So Jesus isn't fitting (laughs) that mold exactly. However, they, they see him doing some miracles, and so they're a little confused, and so they think, all right, if you're, if you are this Messiah, when's this gonna happen, right? It is therefore quite natural that the Pharisees on a day when they were possibly under the impression that Jesus possessed prophetic gifts should ask him when, in his opinion, the Messiah would come to establish the kingdom. 
The Savior, however, replies that the sovereign dominion of God does not come in such a manner that one will be able to determine through accurate observation of signs the exact time of its coming. There is a twofold reason for this. In the first place, the sovereign domain of God has already come on earth in the person of Jesus as a saving and judging force in the life of the Jewish people. So one thing Jesus is saying is, you, you want to see the kingdom? And he says, it's in your midst. I'm standing right here. I'm right here. Uh, where he is uh, saving in the cases where he is recognized and obeyed as the Messiah, but judging in the lives of those who reject him. In the second place, the final coming of the kingdom will take place so suddenly and unexpectedly that no one will be able to prophesy with any degree of accuracy when the day of his second coming will arrive. So this, he's saying here that when you talk about the coming of the kingdom, and this is an interesting phrase, they're looking for a political thing that will set them up a superpower. Jesus is saying, that's not exactly how it's going to work. There's, there's two aspects to it. One is right here. I'm here. And there's this kingdom is expanding. We'll talk about that in just a second, what that is exactly. And secondly, something is going to take place that will usher in a further example of it and uh, uh, it will be more manifested on the day when I come back, his second coming, the return of Christ and ushers in this kingdom, but it's not gonna be the way they thought about it at all. Let me quote another guy on what the kingdom of God is. Just a guy that I know. <clears throat> uh, it's this. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God through the glad submission of the human heart to Jesus Christ. That's the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God on the earth? It's where people have given glad submission. They're not forced. They're not come kicking and screaming. They say yes to Jesus Christ because they want to, because they see it as glorious, and they, give, and they follow him on the earth right now. That's the rule and reign, right? And that happens here, and it happens for eternity to come. There is an already component to it. It's happening right now, right here. And there's a not yet component. S. Paul Trichler, if you're wondering who that, you gotta say it that way if you're like smart. But anyway, a not yet component, okay? So there's something future about it. And that's what makes this story, not parable, but it's this account kind of tricky because Jesus is gonna talk about some things that are happening right now and he's gonna talk about things that are going to happen. And when you look at it from that perspective, you go, oh, I get where he's going with this, okay? Let's keep going on in the account. It says, then he said to his disciples, okay, so the Pharisees come ask him a question. He answers them back. Well, here's what the kingdom is. It's in your midst. And then he looks to his disciples now and he's speaking to them. And he says, then he said to his disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running off after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Okay, so if you're reading this and you're reading it today, you would look at this and say, oh, he's, he's only speaking about his future coming. I think he is speaking about his future coming. The problem, the thing is here is that he links it to the, the very end here. He says, first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this uh, generation. In other words, I think there's a link here speaking about when is this going to be ushered in and there's a certain element that is talking about Good Friday and Easter. Something cataclysmic is gonna happen when Christ goes to the cross willingly, uh, submitting to the will of the Father to pay for the sins of all mankind, you and I and everyone who trusts in Christ, their sins are completely forgiven. He, he then says that's going to happen on Good Friday. And then also uh, uh, Easter, I raised from the dead, okay? This event will usher in the kingdom in a remarkable way. It'll be like the days, the days of the kingdom. And they are Already, So for us right now, they're here. There's also a future component to it. 
and I have, I'm only just gonna do this because I'm not gonna give any picture of what it's like. Okay, so uh, this is, I have no idea what, what, when Christ come back, what it'll look like. I, I use this because I had a dream once about the second coming of Christ and it looked like that. So therefore it must be, must be true. <laughs> the cool thing about that dream, the coolest thing about that dream was there was zero fear. It was like, let's go. Let's go. It was like, the Vikings are actually winning a Super Bowl. Let's go. It was that kind of a feeling I woke up, and I woke up, and I was like, oh, no. It was just a dream. But anyway, let's keep going in the account. Uh, he says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. Now, again, this is, has an already and a not yet. What's happening right now, folks, as he's standing here with the Pharisees, just as it was in those days, it's going to be right now, and it's going to be that way in the future as well. So it has two components here. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage. None of those are bad things, right? Jesus is not saying anything that those are immoral in any way, shape, or form. Those are just normal life, right? We eat, we drink, we marry, we give in marriage, right? Up to the day Noah entered the ark. But then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. Again, sir, none of those things are bad things. That's just they're going about normal activities of the day. But the day left Sodom, uh, well, excuse me, but the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur uh, rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So these are two Old Testament accounts. And if you look at them, First, you have Noah and the flood, right? Which is this story of God looking out and seeing wickedness and deciding, I'm going to give it its just due. So God is not out of control here. He's just saying, if this is what wickedness is, I'm going to punish it accordingly. We deserve a flood every day, but that's not what God does in his mercy. And in his mercy, he rescues some, Noah and his family. Right? The second case, it's this account of a city, Sodom and Gomorrah, and they are very evil, doing all kinds of evil things. Not that other cities aren't as well, but Sodom and Gomorrah get chosen out. And, but Lot gets rescued. Lot and his family get rescued out. Uh, uh, Daryl Bach has written a very good commentary. He says, Jesus compares the nature of the messianic judgment to the flood in the days of Noah, Genesis 7, and to the days of Lot at Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19. Two great periods of judgment against humanity. Just as they did then, people will engage in the, the affairs of life with little attention to God. In that day, people will eat, drink, marry, and be given in marriage, just as they did up to the day Noah got into the ark and the flood came. That was the end. Life stopped. Similarly, in the days of Lot, there was eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, and building. Um, when, but when Lot left Sodom, judgment came, and nothing of the formerly vibrant city was left. Both comparisons picture the absolute finality of God's judgment. The days of the Son of Man will be like those in ancient days of judgment. The idea that there's a second chance on the judgment day is a myth as far as the Bible's concerned. Okay, so we really want to hear this as Jesus is making a case right to the Pharisees who are asking, when is this kingdom coming? He's saying, it's here right now, and yet you're ignoring it. Similarly to the way the people of Noah ignored it, and similarly to the way all the people in this city that Lot was rescued from, they all ignored it. And that's what's happening right now, Pharisees. That's exactly what's happening. I'm standing right here, and you're not following me, right? And so that's, that is one of the big points that Jesus is trying to make here. Now, oh, gonna keep moving on. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one is, who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. We'll come back to that. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Okay, 
So a lot has been said about these verses and, and Jesus is comparing what's happening, what's going to happen on the day of the Son of Man. And again, there's an already component to it. That day is here right now. And right now, you're, you're, you're totally not listening. And so therefore, you are as if uh, you had not paid attention, right? So you're under this judgment if you don't come to the Savior. And the, the, the point of both of the, the uh, Noah account and the Lot account is that judgment has coming, but God was doing a salvation thing. He was pulling some people out and they were, and they were coming with, they were being rescued out of this, right? In Noah's case, what'd you have to do? You just had to get on the ark. In Lot's case, what'd you have to do? You just had to walk out of the city, right? And then he says, Hey, remember Lot's wife. So Lot, if you're familiar with this passage at all, it's a, it's a very, I was going to quote the whole thing, but there's no real point to it because it's very short. It just says, Lot's wife looked back, looks back to the city, and she turns into a pillar of salt, okay? So, and I know lots of like, I mean like Morton, like a box of salt, or what was the, you know, and the whole thing. But it basically is, when Lot's wife looks back, we'll look at this in just a second, she then takes, gets the judgment that was happening to the city. That's, that's what takes place. We'll go into that in just a minute, right? Then he, then he says this very, very famous phrase. Whoever wants to keep their life, whoever wants to save their life, you want to preserve your life, you're going to lose your life. But if you, if you lose your life, you will save it. Lose your life, find it, keep your life, lose it, right? That's what Jesus is trying to get across. That's the main point that he's giving in this whole story is that phrase right there. And then he gives this thing about two people being in, in, a bed, in a bed and one will be taken and one will be left. And the other one says that uh, two will be grinding grain together, one will be taken and the other left. And I'm telling you, if you want to have some fun, uh, the commentaries are all over the place. Which one is good? Is it good to be taken or is it good to be left, right? And so, so a lot of people think, no, one is taken for judgment. So it's a bad thing to be taken, right? Others thinking, no, this is talking about Christ coming in there. And they even think this may have something to do with like a rapture, that Christ, that some people are gone and the other person's there. And, and, and it could be, uh, I don't want to get into a fight about how the end times are going to work here. Uh, here's the deal. Nobody really knows. And it really doesn't matter. I'm just, uh, Jesus is coming back. Okay. We're all in agreement on that. He's coming back and how it's going to happen. Um, it's kind of like how the world was made. I'm not exactly sure. Jesus is in control. It's like, I look at it like a water slide. I get on the water slide and I'm going to come out the bottom, right? There's just no, it's going to happen. You can tell me what you believe. I believe this has a loop-de-loop. -loop. Okay, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Fine, that's great, but it's just gonna happen, okay? So maybe it's the rapture, but a lot of people have said, no, that, this idea of taken was more of taken for judgment. It could be, could be that, but this whole idea of that Christ is trying to say, this is going to happen. Just, you're just sleeping. You're out grinding grain, and this event takes place. And the idea here is, what you're getting from this is, are, are you living in that way? Are you, are, you, are, you, are, you, um, are you looking for the kingdom, or are you just living this life? And so, go to Lot's wife. Okay, so, so she looks back. Okay, so I'm sure this wasn't just a... Uh, just a look back, right? So in other words, it wasn't just like, what, what's going on? No, this was a, she looked back. And in scripture, the word look often means, like people say, you can come to faith just by looking upon Jesus. It doesn't mean you just look. If you remember the Old Testament, there was a bronze serpent. And if, when people were bitten by poisonous snakes, they just looked at the serpent. It meant more than just looking. It meant trusting. It meant longing. It meant going towards. It meant giving allegiance to. And that's what's going on here. So Lot's wife, when she looks back, she's actually saying, you know, I don't think I really want to be rescued out of this. I, I, think, I think that's where I want to be. Now, this verse should remind you, a uh, little teaser, because we're coming back to Romans, of Romans chapter one, right? Romans chapter one, it goes kind of, it just speaks more generically about what human sin is. And it says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator 
who is forever praised. Amen. All right? So they, the, the best definition of sin is right there. What's sin? Sin is ultimately, instead of looking to God for hope and satisfaction, and it says here, worship and service, I look to anything else. I look to created things to fill that spot. And it's like, I really just want to go home. I don't want to be with God. And then Romans 1 just goes on and says later that he gives them over to that. Okay, if that's what you want, go ahead. Lot's wife, she's not named other than Lot's wife, if that's what you want, fine, I'll give you what that city was going to get. And that was this, this, uh, this punishment, right? So that's what takes place there. And that's what he's trying to get across here. All right, last part of our, last part of our, our uh, story for today His disciples then ask him, where, Lord? And then Jesus says, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. (laughs) Uh, I I wasn't able to be on the call. Uh, I was out of town for this when we do the sermon call with each other. And there was a lot of speculation on what does this passage mean, right? Where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. it's, It's typical Jesus. It's a twist. It's like, What? Yep, think about it. I did. What? I'm still thinking about it, right? So let's just go to uh, what a lot of people think maybe this is. So some people think that there's a dead body and Jesus is referring to himself. I'm going to be, I'm going to die. And yet the vultures will gather. Uh, this will attract a crowd and they will see that I, I died in, in my, it could be. Uh, some people think that this is a, uh, there's, there's death, death uh, in, in talks about judgment, and so therefore these vultures will gather, they'll see it, and all that. I think this, sim- it could be, it could be all this stuff, I, I, don't, I don't know. But let me just give you what I think is the simplest explanation. Just as the Pharisees had inquired when, so now the disciples inquire where, where's this going to happen? This in spite of Jesus' instructions in verses 22 to 24, which basically says it's going to be like lightning, you know, yeah. There he had informed them that the question of venue, where would it be, would be moot since the revelation of the Son of Man at the end will be a, com- will be a manifestly public affair. Seen everywhere and by everyone, Jesus' proverbial reply may be redundant, but in light of the disciples' slowness to understand, apparently, it is necessary so. Necessarily so. Just as the presence of carrion, uh, a dead animal, is indicated by circling vultures, so will this presence at the end be clearly evident. I think that's the simplest way of looking at this. He's just saying, hey, well, it could have been a common phrase that they had used at that time. Hey, where, there's, where there's a dead body, there'll be vultures. You will know where. Where is this gonna happen? Just, there's all kinds of signs about Jesus coming. Okay, now, that's our passage, all right? You're like, oh, dude, short sermon. <laughs> I'm not done. So, uh, I'm not even close to done. Uh, I want to just land on this verse. I'm gonna, let me give you a different translation. It's a New Living Translation. It says, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. And if you let your life go, you will save it. That's, that's Jesus' main point here. That's the point of this entire thing, even when it refers to the kingdom and what's happening in the kingdom and how it comes. Those are all interesting things, but at the end of the day, what Jesus is trying to communicate is, if you cling to your life, you'll lose it. And if you lose your, let your life go, you will save it. Now, I, uh, for the last couple of weeks, have been reading a book. Uh, this book right here, uh, by a gentleman by the name of Mark Sayers. Uh, it's a, called A Non-Anxious Presence how a changing and complex world will, give a, will create a remnant of renewed Christian leaders. So it's written for pastors or leaders in the Christian community. And how are, how are we supposed to lead in this age of anxiety, right? And he talks about a non-anxious presence, right? And I was uh, recommended this book by Joel Stegman, one of our church planters. We had had lunch together and he met, recommended. I said, sure, picked it up. And he was only halfway through the book and he says, it's pretty good. And it is, the first half is great. Second half is Okay, Um, the first half is great. I mean, I just couldn't put the thing down. I kept thinking and thinking and thinking. I thought, oh man, this will this will preach. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about, right? So, second half's okay. It's not bad or anything, but it's just it's a little vague. But the first half, his analysis of what's happening in the world right now is spot on, in my opinion. And the fun thing about him is he's an Australian, right? 
So he's an Australian looking at the world from an Aussie mindset, which is completely upside down, right? The world is not meant to be in the South. It's in the North. Everybody knows that. Look at a globe. That's the way the world is, okay? Anyway, so look at when they flush a the toilet. It goes the wrong, you know, whatever. The, uh, so you, you have this book he's writing. He writes about an analysis of why is the world so topsy-turvy right now. And it is. Talk to any social scientist. Talk to any, just it's, you know, we're in this kind of weird time. And what he talks about is he says that there is this thing, we're in a between time right now. There was a period of time where we knew which way was up and we don't now. It's something new and we're in this gray zone, he calls it. We're not sure exactly where we, what this is. Now, he, he goes there by saying what's happening is strongholds that we've had are being, they're, they're not there anymore. Let me give you, I'm gonna quote, I'm gonna quote a few times from the book uh, because I spent two weeks reading this book, okay? So just give me a break. When anxious and concerned about our safety, stability, and security, we create strongholds. In the ancient world, nomads would band together in tribal groups, gaining protection in numbers as agricul agricultural brought uh, greater stability and security, settlements eventually grew into cities. Cities enabled the storing of seeds and crops. Their walls ensure against the unpredictability of nature. The concentration of people in cities enabled the concentration of knowledge and birth schools and guilds, which facilitated the development of expertise and technical advancements. The wealth that cities could generate through trade and taxation could raise armies and fund armaments. A city was a zone that humans could control. Its walls designed to keep out chaos and evil. The city expanded the possibilities of human power. Cities would band together to form confederations, kingdoms, states, and nations. Each grouping was incrementally increasing the power of humans. And he calls that a stronghold. He says, that's what it is. It's a stronghold. It's a place where I'm safe in here, okay? The stronghold is a biblical metaphor. A stronghold is a fortified area with strengthened walls. It can be reinforced by the natural defense properties of ge geography, such as hills and high places that keep the enemy and the evil out. Psalm 1845 speaks of people trembling with fear as they leave the safety of their stronghold. So you have this city, or somehow you feel safe, and then you travel somewhere. He uses an example to show it like this. You, you travel somewhere to another city or stronghold, and in between there, it's scary. It's the wilderness, right? That's where the phrase in the old days was, may you have traveling mercies. Because there's all kinds of dangers. There's bandits, there's wolves, there's all kinds of things out in the wilderness. And that's where anxiety comes from. It's in this wilderness area. We're not in our strongholds. Keep going with the book. He says what, what actually happens here is we create these strongholds in a variety of ways. We can trace back to Eden our desire to seek strongholds outside the will of God. The son of Adam and Eve in the garden were, was to reject, excuse me, the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden was to reject God's way, choosing instead to build their own order. One thing that differentiates humans from God is power. God possesses more power than a human. The serpent's temptation was for Adam and Eve to grow into uh, gaining power apart from God. It was, of course, an impossible project. Divine power only flows from God. Yet this temptation remains hovering before all people to grow in power apart from God. Thus the wilderness, the in-between places of danger, creates a fear in us beyond the immediate, immediate physical fear of being harmed. Okay? So what's happening here now is he's saying we will create these strongholds because we're afraid there's anxiety and so we're creating these places of safety. All right? So he does, in the book, an amazing analysis, I think, of the 20th century and saying what happened after World War I and World War II was that the world's power centered, and this is an Australian saying this, the world's power centered in America. 
It just did. There was a variety of ways. Information, um, uh, military power, economics, everything kind of moved towards the United States. It wasn't that way before then. But after World War I, World War II, it all kind of comes through. He calls it the American century. And this is from an Australian, right? So he's not, he's not in America. You know, he's not that guy. He's just writing what he sees in the world. And he says, this is what took place. But that's not the case now, right? He's going to say, the American century is the unexamined cultural foundation upon which much of our leadership frameworks, strategic assumptions, and measurement success, success rest. However, the dream in the American century was interrupted by a series of shocks, beginning with the attacks of 9-11. Next came the global financial crisis, which led to the Arab Spring, which was a bunch of people in the, in the Arab regions which were revolting against kind of the man or the way that the, the world was, was uh, holding them down because of the economic systems, right? and a new kind of global protest movement, remember Occupy and all that kind of thing that took place in the, in the 90s and, and the 2000s, this reaction against the elite class of the globalized world reached the West in the rise of the anti-establishment and populist political backlash epitomized by Brexit. This is where I fear, but I'm going to say it anyway because he wrote it, and the election of Donald Trump. Okay, so I'm not... I'm not making any statements about Trump other than this. Let me say this about Trump. Oh, dear. Here we go. Um, core, C-O-R at HopeCC.com, if you're wondering what my email is. <laughs> we elected Trump primarily because he was an outsider. Okay, now we in the outsider vote. Oh, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we did in 2016. It was the Jesse Ventura thing. It was the anti-establishment. It was sticking it to him, Right. He was one of us, even though last time I checked my bank account, I ain't anywhere near like Donald Trump, but he was, he drained the swamp, right? The whole idea was this backlash against some of this old system, which is fascinating. And maybe this is a statement, maybe I'm fearful here, but, but he, he talked about making America great again, but he actually was a candidate that was running to totally go against the way the powers that be. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say. C-O-R at HopeCC.com, if you're wondering. So I'm just saying, this is a rise of something that is taking place. And it's true, man. It's totally true. The downside of social media and the internet uh, became more apparent. Fake news, misinformation, and trolling became planetary, planetary problems. Uh, power was diffusing and decentralized, moving away from the central strongholds that had shaped culture. And what, he's, what his argument in the book is, he says, when you get the internet and you get globalization, it moves away from one place or one stronghold and it goes completely to decentralization. And decentralization does not look neat at all. It looks like this. You get some kid in his basement who makes a TikTok video that is viral and is having more influence than some of our elected public officials. It is, it is the Wild West, right? That's, that's the new world order, Okay. Oh, everybody's kind of getting more anxious as I'm saying this, right? You are. Because the strongholds that we had, the ways we thought up was up and down was down, it just isn't that way. That's not the world we live in anymore, Dorothy. It's, Kansas has gone bye-bye. It is, it's different. It's a different world. You're like, dude, aren't you supposed to be making us not anxious? Wasn't the book a non-anxious presence? You're killing me here. I understand that. I'm going to make it worse. One more, one more slide from the book and we're done. <laughs> the first most valued by contemporary stronghold of self is comfort. In the contemporary world, feeling good is the expe expected normative state of being. When one doesn't experience good feelings, if a task is unpleasant, if a relationship goes through a difficult period, if a job is tough, it is taken as a signal that something is wrong or that something is wrong with you. The absence of good feelings becomes an amber warning light. I have very few people in my life that love to just stir up the pot in conversation, one of which is my barber. I love the guy. He, I got my hair cut yesterday. Uh, Pretty good, huh? So, uh, and I always get my money's worth. I just sit down and say, make me look good. And he says, I don't, that's of my pay grade, but okay. But, so, but the, the idea here is 
He just loves to mix it up. There's a bunch of people waiting, and he just asks me questions. He knows I'm a pastor. What are you preaching about tomorrow, pastor? And I get to <laughs> share the sermon. It's just the greatest conversations. And we, we can have this great thing, and we're good friends, and we don't agree on everything, and it's just wonderful. That's just not the case anymore. We don't have those conversations. I don't have, it's just, it's touchy-feely, and I don't make me feel good. And so he, he goes on to say, this drive to find a place of ease and good feelings is known as a comfort zone. We create a kind of stronghold based on feeling comfortable, at ease, and unchallenged by external distractions, disruptions, and intrusions. Success is maintaining the emotional balance of the comfort zone. However, this approach to life is built on a religious assumption. Religious meaning, I'm going to give worship to it, not like a religion. Religious, like, I'm going to give worship, I have a worshipful assumption that the stronghold can deliver a type of environment that facilitates a life that feasts on the fruit of comfort. When I read that, I went, that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Exactly. That's the problem. There's nothing wrong with eating, drinking, marrying, and, and, and go buying and selling and all these kind of things. It, it's not the problem at all. The deal, when I stop and say, why are we so anxious right now? What's going on here? There we go. Why are we so anxious I think a big part of that is because we've taken some of the strongholds of whatever they were and they were making us comfortable. They were making us safe outside of God because those things are diminishing, if not already crumbling, if not already gone, and now it's causing people to freak out. And what Jesus is saying, and I think it's a gift to the American church saying, oh, was, was, that, was that your God? because you're freaking out as if it was a God. I think it's actually a gift, a gift to us right now that we're able to say, whoa, if I have all these cultural anxieties, was I worshiping certain political things or a world in which pot wasn't legal or whatever? Was it, was it, what's going on? Is Christ my life or is American culture or the way I want to see things or a world order or whatever? What's, what's my life here? And I think it's a gift to us, actually. I think it's a gift. He quotes in his book, he quotes a quote from uh, the, the renowned theologian Henry Nouwen when Nouwen says this. He says, we remain victims of our society and continue to be entangled in the illusions of the false self. Jesus entered into this furnace. There he was tempted with three compulsions of the world and Jesus' temptations. One, to be relevant, turn these stones into loaves. To be spectacular, throw yourselves down and to be powerful. I'll give you all these kingdoms. Those are the three temptations that are written about Matthew chapter four. He says, there he affirmed God is the only source of his identity. He says, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Now, let's look at those three things. To be relevant, spectacular, and have influence. Those are not bad things. But when those, those things, or anything else, become ultimate things, they become God things, and then they're idols. And that's why Jesus says, no, I, I was not here to do those things. I was here to follow the will of my Father, and therefore, I'm worshiping and trusting him alone. When you make Christ your life, Everything else becomes important, but not life. When you hang on to your life, and Christ is just kind of second place or not at all, then when those things are lost, you're completely in anxiety. You're completely thrown about. Let me show you an example of this. Uh, the Apostle Paul is teaching Timothy how to, how to help people who are wealthy in this church that Timothy is pastoring in Ephesus. He says this, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. And this is the way they will lay up treasure for themselves as the firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. 
You see what he's saying? He doesn't say, tell those rotten rich people they're terrible and they're rotten. No, he doesn't say, he says, hey man, you have a huge opportunity here. You have before you something that you could make as a stronghold. You could say, I'm gonna put my money, my bank account, that is my stronghold. That's my life. That's how I define myself. And the gospel comes along and says, you know what? It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Educated, not educated. You, you get an opportunity here to make Jesus Christ your stronghold and then everything else is just a resource. It, it's not a bad thing. It's just a resource. Command them to put their hope in God and to enjoy worldly things. That's fine. It's great to enjoy those things. Just don't make them God things. This happened uh, to me big time in 2016 when uh, Carol got diagnosed with cancer. And I remember thinking of all the worldly things in my life that I enjoy. I enjoy our marriage the best. I at least do. I don't know if you'd say that, but I, I, I do. <laughs> and I remember thinking right after her diagnosis, and by the way, she's, she's, uh, she had surgery and she's, she's in remission and she's, she's the only one who knows she's cancer-free in our house. So, um, but in those days, weeks before that period of time, before we knew that she was gonna be cancer-free, it, it made me think, Lord, is, is Carol my life? Is this, is this marriage? Is, this, is that my life? And no, it's not. I mean, she, no. It's, I really enjoy her and I really enjoy being married, but ultimately, at some point in time, that's going to end for one of us or both of us. It's saying, I don't know, but it's not eternal. It's not worth putting your hope in. And you know what? It was never meant to be. Because Carol's a great wife. You suck as a God. You know, no offense. You're just, you're just not gonna fill me that way. And nor should I ask her to do that. So that's what Jesus is getting at here. If you hang on to things like that, then God will ultimately say, go ahead, run with that. How's that gonna work for you? They're meant to be enjoyed. They're never meant to be worshiped. I'm meant to be worshiped. I'm meant to be followed. I am the savior of the world. And these are the days of the son of man. He has been crucified and has risen again. He's ascended. And one day we'll come back and we live right now in those days, right here, right now. And we have a, or do we have glad submission of the human heart to Jesus Christ and what he's done? C.S. Lewis, it says it this way. He says, give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambition and favorite wishes every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will really be yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. I used to look at this passage and say, it was like, oh man, you better be afraid now because judgment is coming, and so you better go to Jesus because judgment is coming and you don't want that, right? So you better go to Jesus, even though I don't, I'm not sure I really want that either, but it's better than this, right? I, I, I follow Jesus just because I want to get out of hell free car, right? I don't want to go there. Okay, well, that, that's 2% that's true. 98% of it is this. Jesus Christ is actually life-giving. He's like the most joyful thing ever. He's the thing in the midst of any storm. You can say, well, at least that's I got to hang on to. My mama used to always say, if you lose everything, but you still got God, you got everything. Lose your life and you find it. F hang on to your life and you lose it. Just nothing but anxiety driving. So let me, we're gonna close and I'll invite the worship team up and I want you to think of a couple things. Do you see following Jesus like a chore or, or like life, really giving life? And is Jesus your stronghold, your comfort zone? Of all comfort zones, is Jesus that place? Or do you constantly want to put something else in there? And I think that's exactly what Christ is talking about. We're going to now close our service with a couple of songs, and it's an opportunity to respond. And here's how we're going to respond today. 
We, we're gonna, I, you'll, you'll stand in just a moment. We'll sing some songs. The songs are like prayers. But then we're gonna take communion. And I want you to do something special. This table is open for anyone who's made Jesus Christ their stronghold. I don't care if that's just happened two and a half minutes ago or happened two and a half years ago. Doesn't matter. Longer. This table and the tables in the back, they're open for anyone who makes Jesus Christ your stronghold. And yet other things creep in and they constantly want to be that stronghold. And here's what I want you to do. As you stand to sing and as you get out of your chair, I want you to think about, I am now leaving all of my life all of my things that I have clung on to, all the things that are, are, are created for my enjoyment and joy that I maybe have slipped a little bit into the worship category, I am now leaving them in my pew. And I'm going to walk to Jesus. Jesus, you are my life. You're making a declaration. You're drawing a line in the sand. Today, I'm coming to Jesus and he is my life. Let's pray together. Lord, I want to thank you for this story, this account that so clearly makes it known that, Lord, that you are life and that it's a joyful thing. And one day you'll come and reign, it'll be face to face and our hearts will just leap with joy. So God, I pray for everyone in this room. I pray for every single person in this room. I know myself, even walking through this book the last couple of weeks, have even identified some areas that I feel like, yeah, those have become strongholds. Those have become comfort zones. Those have become things that I don't want to give up for you. And, and I want to thank you, Lord, that you just reminded me, oh, it's nothing to give up because of what I gain in Christ and to, to make that. So Lord, I pray that in this room. I pray that people by the power of your spirit and the joy set before them, they would move from those strongholds. They take those things that are, that are good things and yet they've been slipped into God things and they would turn from them. And they would come to you and to you only as the Savior and Lord. Maybe someone for the very first time in their lives or given their life like Ben did to Jesus Christ this morning and are coming and taking their first communion. God, give them grace in this choice and in this newfound life in Jesus. We ask that you'd fill this room even as we respond, Lord, by the power of your spirit. Do miraculous things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.